Hi. Um, I was listening to something or rather reading a statement by a former prime minister who was on the liberal side, or used to be. Um, and what he said was, if we, the liberals, are going to stake our political future on social issues, such as protecting transsexual rights, then we're going to lose to the conservatives who have more meaty, immediate issues, such as immigration and immigration quotas. What bothers me about that statement is that it, first of all, it pits two different things, two, two, two separate issues against each other in an either or format. But worst of all, or worse, it doesn't actually maintain what people think of as liberal values. So the first reason is that the prime minister's argument, which essentially summarizes the arguments between conservatives and liberals as practical versus idealistic, the first reason it should fail is because in fact, the argument for the liberals has always been not just a small subsection of minority rights, but the whole thing. So when you talk about something like minority rights, we're not talking about a small subsection of those rights. They're connected to everything else in a, in a legal system that is supposed to enforce those rights for all of the minorities within a country or within a society. So the first mistake the Prime Minister makes is singling out a subsection of a larger issue and then it's attempt to compare it to a very broad issue such as immigration. And in fact, the idea behind liberalism has always been that you have this other side over here, the conservatives, and they're going to promise you practical things and it's easier to get those things like money and stability and security. And it's much harder to have a society that is more open because the more open you are, the less security you tend to have and the more randomness you also tend to have. And because of that, the conservatives will always be able to argue that whatever liberal ideals exist are going to be unrealistic. So the battle has not been between a subsection of minority rights versus a broad social, another broad social issue. The idea has always been the liberals are going to try to push the envelope socially in order to show that imperfection, or rather the perfection is not the goal. And the reason for that is multi-layered. And in order to understand that, you have to, first of all, understand another problem with the Prime Minister's juxtaposition. Immigration, first of all, has to do with passports. There's legal and illegal immigration. And if you want to go back and think about how expensive travel was in the early 1900s, or just go back and look at, look at an old plane, you can see that tickets were, could not have been cheap. The planes had very, very wide seats. And if you were seven feet tall, you would have been comfortable in those chairs. If, even if you haven't seen a, an older plane, you can think about the reputation that Pan Am had at the time before its bankruptcy, where it basically treated its, its flyers, its customers, and as well as its staff as royalty. And if you were a stewardess, you were basically in a position where you were, one, you were in a position of having one of the most envied jobs in the whole world. And the reason for that was because travel was expensive. It was something that for the most part, only affluent people could afford. So as a result, most people did not, did not have passports. And in fact, did not need passports to travel. So if you don't believe me, you can look up the year that the United States passed a mandate, a legal mandate for passports. And it's, you can just Google Passport Act or Passport Control Act. I think it was 1928, I could be wrong. So, for one thing, 
immigration has always been with us because passports are an extremely new phenomenon, which also makes sense, not only because of the affluence involved uh, in order to travel, but just technology that's involved in order to keep track of everyone who's traveling. So most of the time, immigration has always happened illegally, or at least without legal sanction. The reason that's important is because it, the concept of immigration typically comes up and is debated when the economy is not doing well, when people do not feel as if they are getting ahead. They tend to focus on immigration under the perfectly reasonable idea that uh, they would have, that there would be more jobs available if the number of available workers decreased. Of course, we don't talk about what kind of jobs, quality of the jobs, uh, but from a strictly logical, you know, plus minus scenario, that conservative argument uh, has merit. Until, once again, you put it within context because every society has had to have workers, especially blue collar workers. If you go to Malaysia, you'll notice that you'll have a, a very nice Chinatown and multiple districts. And in one of these districts, you'll see that in fact, the British, which had a, you know, which were controlling one of the ports on behalf of one of the sultans, um, basically invited Chinese people to come over and establish, you know, land, you know, just an outpost. And when you look at that history, it was simply because they had to have labor, you know, laborers coming in, and also because of the lack of development. The other part people forget is that you, all this development is something relatively new. So when you had, say, the, Mal the Malaysians under British uh, jurisdiction or occupation, in that case, it wasn't occupation. Uh, the Sultan invited them in because he was competing with somebody, with other groups. Um, and so ultimately, you have a situation where the British would invite the Chinese to come in to work. They didn't need passports. And the idea, of course, was that you would be able to settle down within this place on a long-term basis because there wasn't much development, but also because the British had an interesting system, at least at that point in time. What they did was they said, they essentially appointed or allowed somebody within the community to run his own city or town. And the idea would be that if anything happened within that town, that Chinese leader would, would be responsible for it. You could not call in the police. Uh, you could not call in any, any state resources. And so whatever would happen within that city would be under the jurisdiction of exclusive jurisdiction of a local. That's important in many ways because it shows you the different ways in which countries have invited immigrants. And at that point, tried to figure out the best way of maximizing labor from them. A happy worker is a good worker. And that was, in this case, a good idea. Because when you go into that town in Malaysia today, it's still, you know, it's not as developed as obviously Singapore, but you don't get the sense that you had a lot of atrocities or riots happening there. You get the sense that it was a well-run shop. At least from what I can see today, I could be wrong. So number one, immigration has always happened without legal sanction for most of our lives because labor has always been needed, especially blue collar labor. Even here in Singapore, they accepted a lot of people who were Sri Lankan who became shipbuilding specialists. The Sri Lankans moved up, the Singaporeans promoted them, made them a part of their society. And that's one of the reasons that you have this multicultural society today in Singapore with the Tamils and so on. And a lot of people here who are Tamil were probably fleeing Ceylon, which is, uh, or which we now consider to be a failed state, which later became Sri Lanka. So number one, that's one example. You know, you can look at it in another way. If you're an American, you can look at it in the sense that people were, need, were needed to uh, work in the fields for sugar, tobacco, cotton. And as a result, uh, people were forced to come and work in those fields without a passport, without papers. And the way that this became acceptable 
uh, was through racism uh, and at the idea that certain groups were inferior to other groups and also because of the total lack of rights that those people received, to those that that labor group received, lack of income, you name it. That failure to manage the labor pool as well as the British did in Malaysia led to increasing oppression. And that's the problem with mistreating labor, which is often imported, because one thing leads to another. The slavery system, even if it, were, if it was not slavery, um, could have been a guild system of, of, of internships, but it was not. And as a result, you either were stuck in an indentured servitude situation or a much more brutal slave situation. And again, none of those people had passports. So number one, immigration has always been with us because the demand for labor has also always been with us. And, the, and typically what we're dealing with is not the immigration issue, but under what conditions the immigrants are allowed to come and work. The United States, of course, had the most oppressive regime uh, to the point where you can't call people immigrants. Um, Whereas the Malay, the, the, at one point in time in Malaysia, had, they seem to have had a more peaceful system. So that's one of the problems that we have when we talk about immigration out of context. The second issue is not only has immigration always been with us, the second issue is how do we determine on what conditions people can work? And when people like Martin Luther King talk about the arc of justice eventually, you know, being long, but eventually creating a path for justice to be fulfilled, what he's talking about is actually, in part, immigration and refugees. So a lot of the immigration in the past has been, in fact, refugees fleeing war. And those people were put in a position where uh, they had to find jobs, oftentimes without assistance. And that's where the private sector would come in. But I'm getting off topic there. The second real issue is that when you have immigrants coming in, you're in a position where you oftentimes are in a, assisting groups that are fleeing. In other words, it's, it's a moral issue. I don't think that's particularly, I don't have, I mean, have anything particularly useful or new to talk about with respect to the refugee issue. Because it's an argument we can all understand, and very few people are anti-refugee. The real fact of the matter is that people are typically in positions where they don't want immigration because the economy is not doing well. And the reason for that is because of inflation. If people are doing very well, uh, oftentimes you have prices going up, but without, but what's happened though is that prices have gone up, but without wages going up. And people tend to blame, in some cases, immigration for that. But of course, that has to do with a lot of factors um, beyond any, anyone's control. And so ultimately, what we have here is not that people have been against immigration. They've always been, they've always accepted it. The only issues have been under what conditions uh, legally and under what conditions um, competitively. The United States, of course, would also imp also imported Chinese laborers, but only imported the men. Had a lot of problems with the way they did it. Um, you know, we pit pitted the, men the Chinese against the uh, local immigrant pool, which is also in some cases immigrant, but from Europe. Uh, would then have to, which then of course caused a security issue, which then would lead to, you know, uh, unions trying to come in to facilitate which then led businesses to hire security um, to break up the unions in order to keep wages lower than what they otherwise would be. Uh, if I think those were called the Pinkerton police, private security, and so on and so forth. So you can see once again that the need, the need for labor has led to a very complex situation where you had to have people working because the demand for labor was really high. And the only question is, how do you create a system where people would live peacefully with each other? Uh, of course, you had language issues as well, 
but also where you would maximize output by the worker. Because it probably is not going to be a lot of fun coming to a foreign country uh, and not being able to speak a language and having to work 10, 15 hours a day. So once you look at immigration in that context, you can see very quickly that it's no longer a battle between this one social issue that's always been with us, but really trying to figure out the terms and conditions under which immigration should occur. We should also think about the fact that the more you make something illegal, the more you give rise to the black market, which then gives rise to things like the mafia, makes the mafia or the black market forces more powerful, which then once again creates a security problem. But that's another, that's a separate issue. So the real problem with the prime minister's argument, uh, he's British by the way, is not only that he sees immigration out of context, but it's that he's pitting it against a very vulnerable minority which is precisely the thing that liberals are not supposed to do. You're not supposed to give in to this idea that practicality always, in every case, trumps idealism, just because the, the idealists are not in a position to be able to fulfill their vision perfectly. So what we have here is yet another improper juxtaposition that creates problems debating these issues from the get-go, from inception. But there's also this other argument where you can say that today we have machines and that because we have machines, advanced machines, we no longer need as much of a, as high of a labor pool. Because we don't need as much, as many laborers coming in, we can convert a lot of that work to machines um, or we can make a lot of that work machine-based what we no longer have a situation where we're having to deal with sudden rises in labor that, that necessitate immigration. We can simply have a situation where we let the machines do the work and people stay where they are and we get more data and eventually we can sort of control supply and demand uh, and the response to them quickly and efficiently. That's the best argument to make today if you don't want immigration, is that the technology has made, a, has made the need for immigration uh, and, and with respect to a labor pool uh, has, has made it unnecessary. So the response, even if you make that argument, which is the best argument, you still fail. And let me tell you why. For one thing, these supply chains have, been, have become globalized um, worldwide since World War II, since 1945. Uh, in order to promote not only currency uh, being used worldwide as a universal medium of exchange between allies, as, as universal as you can possibly get, um, but also in order to rebuild countries uh, that, that were bombed. Uh, and, to, and in order to rebuild societies, you have to have an economy. You can make that economy. Uh, it's a lot easier to, to have an economy where you have people, as opposed to machines, working on things. So ultimately, the argument that you can make against the best argument, the best anti-immigration argument is that number one, even today in 2020, the supply chains are not configured to match supply and demand perfectly or even efficiently. We know that because of the coronavirus situation today where even the advanced countries are not able to generate enough supply of critical items uh, critical items that actually deal with life and death, such as uh, respirators and even something as simple as masks. So you have something that's a little bit more complex, like a, like a respirator, uh, and you have something that's not complex at all, like a mask. Um, and neither of those things have been proven to be subject to a perfect supply chain domestically. And in fact, one of the reasons that we are undergoing this situation here uh, is, is to make those supply chains more concrete in order to probably uh, get, get to a situation where you know, immigration as well as other points and data uh, are more stable. So you have a situation where number one, the domestic supply chains are just not there yet. We know that because of the 2020 coronavirus scare that's happening right now. 
Um, and number two, you still don't have an opportunity to measure everything. So even if you get to a point where you have a perfect supply chain, there are some things that cannot be measured. So education, for example, you don't know, you can't be, you're not gonna be able to measure the best teachers. The machines will never be able to be, become the best teachers. You've got food. People have always stolen ideas from other people, food being the most obvious one. You're not gonna be, even if you have an AI that can capture uh, all the recipes in the world, you're not gonna be in a position where you're gonna know, you know which, which are the best ones, or even you know, which are the ones that you would want um, within your community. Uh, so in other words, something might be very popular in India, but too spicy for the United States. The only way to figure that out would be to open up a restaurant and have people from different parts of India come in and cook for you. Uh, and even if, they, even, if, even if you do that, you control the immigration that way, you still don't know if the, the taste buds of people within the Midwest will be the same as the people in Canada. So once again, you have this idea that people don't mind immigration and stealing ideas when it comes to food and spices, but they mind when it comes to a lot of other things. So beyond, even beyond that, you have this idea that things cannot be, not everything can be measured. So a lot of ideas, even just the invention of coffee, happened by accident. So there's always been this idea that even if you could measure everything, you can't measure the future because the future hasn't happened yet. But what you can do is you can limit the future by an over-reliance on data. And so you will get, as the conservatives promise you, you will get more security and more stability, but at, at, at a cost of a future which is more limited. And in fact, you have all these avenues that you could walk down. And the idea that the liberals can argue is that we are in a position where those avenues become restricted by, because you're cutting off the, the spores, the catalysts that generate potential new avenues for you to walk down on. And that's, again, very easy to understand, understand in terms of fusion, like, re like recipes, uh, food recipes, uh, where you have somebody coming in, they, you know, this is the best case scenario, right? Uh, so, you know, you have two chefs coming in from different parts of the world. Uh, they end up creating something that's, uh, you know, completely different, that's never been done before, that would not otherwise have been possible had they not met and liked each other and worked, or at least been able to work together. Uh, an example of that would be here in Singapore, uh, where you have something called the Roti John. It's basically, I don't actually like it that much, but it seems to be quite popular. Uh, but it's a combination of Indian and maybe even Western uh, food. And it could probably only have happened in Singapore because of its combination of Western and Eastern influence and Indian influence. So that's an, uh, something that would not have been possible if we had listened to the conservative argument, say 50 years ago, and restricted immigration uh, in an effort to promote stability. So the arguments being made by the conservatives are actually arguments that limit the future. And they're not particularly arguments that are uh, conducive to a happy society either because you have to understand that a lot of the, if you're, a lot of the, the ways that we think about establishing terms and conditions for workers, one of the best ways to get maximum effort, that's the whole point of establishing terms and conditions. You wanna match wages to effort, sorry, match wages to demand, supply, but you also want to have people, you know, fully invested so they don't jump ship. And these days, even if you have perfect, perfect domestic supply chains, a work, worker can still move. They can still move from a country to another country. So even if you master a highly sought after one, even if you master all the domestic supply chains, you're still in a position where the worker himself or herself might leave. Uh, so one of the reasons we have things, one of the reasons the terms and conditions of labor are so difficult to, to pin down because it's not just wages, it's not just legal rights, it's not just access to legal rights and fulfillments of contracts. Um, it's also the idea that if you think you're working towards a common goal as a team, uh, you're able to maximize effort that way. A sports analogy is the easiest analogy you can get. Uh, there are obviously situations where players will, will accept less money to stay in one place rather than go to another team that, that offers them more money. Um, one example, if you're an American, that would be very obvious would be San Antonio. I think Tim Duncan for years accepted less money than what he could have otherwise made 
uh, just to keep that team together uh, that was functioning very well. And if you can argue that the conservatives might say that practicality is something that can be associated with as a motivational tool, and that's true, except that we've already seen this play out before between the Soviet Union and the United States. Practicality can be, if there's one country that was practical, it was the Soviet Union. If you go back and look at what their economy was based on, it was infrastructure. What they built is still standing today uh, in Russia and in Eastern Europe. And the reason that, one of the reasons that they were able to do such a good job in terms of infrastructure was because in part they were dealing with uh, this teamwork, this idea that we're against this decadence of the West, this superficiality of the West. And that's going to be our, our, our conservative organizing principle. So in some cases, practicality can work, but only in opposition to something else. And one, and the, one way to, this, to describe that would be the San Antonio Spurs uh, versus the, Los, the Showtime Lakers, the Los Angeles Lakers, uh, which would be more flashy, you know, and, and basically less practical. So ultimately, you have this idea that for the most part, practicality does not maximize output, does not maximize effort, because what you human, human beings need more than just practical things in order to, to maximize their effort. They need to believe in something. And if you have a country that's based on um, you know, marginalizing uh, the future possibilities, it's marginalizing the future uh, in terms of restricting the number of avenues possible, um, as a philosophical foundation from the get-go, then what you've done is you've you automatically at a disadvantage against a, a competitor that does not minimize that motivational tool. And this is something that's extremely important because you know you can force somebody to work for you, but they're not going to give you the maximum effort, um, and they may even you know of course lie to you, uh, and that's not the ideal situation. So what you want you can't underestimate the idea of having uh, of ideology, of liberal ideology, you know, connecting people and maximizing the output to the point where you can create a society, um, a kind of society that, that you may not even under understand that you're making, because again, you don't know all the different possibilities. And that, that sort of gap in, uh, that, that sort of gap that you leave in favor of the imagination seems to be necessary for maximizing uh, output, for maximizing not just output, but happiness. Um, and that's something that's very obvious when you look at um, good, good books and good stories. And if you don't have those, when, and practical societies tend not to uh, relish those kinds of uh, creative abstract outputs. I mean, Stalin, of course, killed, I think it was Trotsky, all the way out in Mexico. Um, and, you know, once again, you have this increasing oppressiveness that tends to come with a system that doesn't allow room for imagination, uh, which, of course, is only possible when you don't know all the potential outcomes. So the liberal argument has always been that you may not, has always, has always been this exchange um, of less security for more imagination, um, for more privacy. And the battle has always been how to get that balance calibrated properly uh, so that you have a society that feels as if it's getting somewhere, it's getting ahead, um, not just for themselves, but for their families and for their neighbors. And when a prime minister puts pits this immigration issue, which is really a labor issue, an illegal issue, against a vulnerable, against the rights or, or, or maintaining uh, the rights of a vulnerable minority, you can see very quickly that we're living now in a society where we're lurching towards a practical society that is too practical because the liberals who were supposed to uphold this, this idea that calibration uh, is an ongoing difficult process, um, the idea, which by the way should be easier now that we, could, that, that we have more data, we didn't have data before, um, as much data before, it should be easier to get there to, to the idea of a liberal society, uh, the more data that you have, because you can get that stability, you can calibrate things a lot easier with the economy, or with things like, you know, uh, currency fluctuations and so on. Um, so ultimately, I guess the point of all this would be 
uh, if anybody raises immigration, number one, to explain that you know illegal Im immigrants have always been with us because the need for labor has always been with us, and passports were not invented until you can ask them when were passports invented, uh, you know, and just see, see what they say. The second issue is, is ultimately, you know, it's immigration is not you know something that tends to be the focus of any political. Uh, campaign, unless, you know, unless the economy is not doing well and people don't feel as if their work is getting them, it's, it's pushing them forward. Um, and even and so ultimately, the, you're in a position where immigration becomes this uh, sort of focus point uh, when the economy has failed. And when the economy has failed and security has failed, those are actually government issues or police issues, policing issues. And you know, everyone would rather have a job where the job is easier. And that's not the point. Um, the, the job isn't to make you know, society as easy and, as possible. Because when you do that, you lose imagination, you lose the imperfections that sometimes make a society worth living in.